Are you a scaling SaaS founder? Ready to make the leap from leading a team to leading an organization? Join us each week as we refill your think tank with actionable tips and strategies from great business minds you know and those you don't know yet. This is SaaS Fuel with your host, five-time entrepreneur, SaaS founder, and globetrotting adventurer, Jeff Maines. Welcome back to the SaaS Fuel Podcast, where end of year review is like Santa's list. You know, checking it twice, finding out who's crushing it, or who needs a little more holiday spice. I'm your host, Jeff Maines. I'll be to be SaaS founders like you. Scale from seven figures, which is good, to eight and nine figures, which is outstanding. Together, we supercharge revenue growth, create premium valuation, and craft a business you're proud of and a life of impact and freedom that you love. I had coffee with a friend and fellow SaaS founder this week, and as usual, it had been way too long since we hung out together. Yeah, sign of the times, I guess. But in today's fast-paced business world, targets and metrics often overshadow human connection. And I think right there lies an underutilized superpower, and that is gratitude. It's the soft whisper that can cause a seismic shift in workplace morale and customer loyalty. In the relentless pursuit of progress, pausing to express heartfelt thanks isn't just nice, it's essential. And in the midst of chasing KPIs and bottom lines, taking a moment to genuinely thank someone can really be a game changer. A company that does this surprisingly well is Starbucks. More than just a coffee giant, Starbucks has brewed a culture of appreciation. My middle daughter actually worked there for several years, and I was really surprised and impressed at the, the culture that they built. You know, they recognize their employees or partners, as they call them, with benefits, growth opportunities, and, and really fostering a sense of belonging. They've got a real sense of community there. And their customer appreciation is equally robust. Personalized service, rewards program that goes beyond the usual. And, you know, if you have stars, which is their rewards, and they expire at a certain point. And if you have stars that expires, you know, you can give them a call and they're really quick to take care of you and make that, uh, make that right, extend them out. It's kind of a cool thing. The just service levels are, are just above and beyond what you find in many places. But Starbucks understands that gratitude isn't just an afterthought. It's an integral part of their ethos. How can we distill this essence of gratitude into our own businesses? Here's a three-step approach. First, customized appreciation. Forget about cookie-cutter thank yous or email templates. Make your gratitude personal and heartfelt. For employees, acknowledge their unique contributions and milestones. We could honestly do better at that. For customers, remember their preferences and surprises that resonate with them personally. It's about creating a moment of connection that's as warm as their favorite latte. Even something as simple as giving a handwritten note in this crazy world of automated text goes a long ways. Second, foster a gratitude-first culture. Embed gratitude into your company's culture. Make it a norm, not an exception. Encourage teams to celebrate each other's wins. You know, peer-to-peer recognition goes a long, long way. Let thank you be as common as morning coffee in your office. And when gratitude percolates through your organization and employees and customers don't just feel valued, they feel like they belong. And that is next level. And third, strategic gratitude. It's something we were kind of talking about. How do we elevate that to something that's really strategic for the business? So strategic gratitude. We want to elevate gratitude to a strategic business practice. So for customers, this might mean loyalty programs that genuinely reward, well, their loyalty. For team members, think beyond standard perks. You know, consider career development, wellness programs, recognition initiatives that show them they're valued far beyond their job description. You know, so show them that their gratitude goes beyond words. It's woven into the very way you do business. Expressing gratitude is more than a courtesy. It's a catalyst for creating a more positive workplace, building stronger connections, stronger customer relationships, and setting a tone of respect and value. 
It's about making everyone who interacts with your business feel not just recognized, but genuinely appreciated. And, you know, there's that, that idea again, belonging. You know, they, they feel like that they found their people. It's not just a means to an end, that they're not just cogs in the machine, but the heart and soul of your business. We definitely live in an era that is fixated on rapid growth and competition. So let's champion the cause of gratitude. It's not just about saying thanks. It's about weaving a tapestry of appreciation that touches every aspect of your business. If you want to elevate your business, check out my book, Small Fish, Big Pond, Building a World-Class Business that Swims Circles Around Competitors. Small Fish, Big Pond delivers powerful marketing and leadership lessons guaranteed to enhance your marketing, wrap value around your clients, and guide their buying journey to conclude that your company is the only solution for them. It includes step-by-step frameworks and time-tested growth principles to attract ideal clients, convert them, and then transform them into your brand ambassadors. Pick up the print, ebook, or audio today at smallfishbigpond.com, Amazon, or your favorite book source. Makes a great gift, and all book profits go to charity all the time. Our founder on Tuesday was Alex Boyd, founder of Aware, which is a LinkedIn commenting tool, and also founder of Revenue Zen, a B2B growth agency. We talked about product pivots, building smart, and my favorite moment, the difference between building a solution that's useful and one that's cool. Such, such great advice. And our expert guest last week was Jason Kruger, president and founder of Signature Analytics. Jason demystified finance and helped us run our company smarter, more profitably, and with way less stress. If you missed either one of those episodes, go back and give them a listen. My guest today is AJ Wilcox, a LinkedIn ads pro who founded B2Link.com way back in 2014. They are the LinkedIn ad agency and an official LinkedIn partner. AJ has managed over $150 million in spend on the platform. It's pretty impressive. And five of the world's top 10 LinkedIn ad accounts. That's even more impressive. AJ is also the host of the LinkedIn Ad Show podcast. He's a triathlete. And, you know, every time we talk, he is at his treadmill desk. He's just going. He lives in Utah with his beautiful wife, five adorable kids, and his company car is a wicked fast go-kart. I've got to ask him about that. Welcome someone who is as spectacular with ads as he is fascinating, AJ Wilcox. Hey, AJ, welcome to SAS Fuel. So excited to be here, Jeff. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, you are a LinkedIn ads pro. That's what we're talking about today is how to get great ads, uh, great performing ads on LinkedIn. Uh, so what led you to, uh, to LinkedIn to start with and how did you decide to specialize on that platform? Well, the most recent job that I had before starting my own company um, was at a, actually at a SaaS company. And it, this was pre-IPO. Nice. Um, it, it was a business intelligence software. And on my very first day, you know, my background with it was in SEO and Google Ads. And so I'm talking to the CMO, okay. my new boss, and laying out all my strategies. And I remember her saying, oh, all that sounds great. Go ahead and execute it. Uh, but just so you know, we started a pilot with LinkedIn ads about two weeks ago. Take it over. See what you can do. And I didn't want to look stupid to my new boss. So I jumped into the platform and, and started messing around. And within about two weeks, my sales team was coming to me and saying, AJ, we don't know what you're doing over here, but we're fighting over your leads. Please keep it up. And so I went to go look at like <laughs> in the CRM, what are these leads that they're talking about? Every single one of them was sourced from LinkedIn at that point. And that was kind of the beginning of my journey to realize, wow, there's something more to this platform than I knew before. I ended up growing that account to become LinkedIn's largest spending account in the world. And then after that, you know, two and a half years of running the biggest account, I was like, all right, there's got to be more companies than just this one that could use LinkedIn ads help. And so that's when I started BT Linked and uh, we're, we're now 10 years old. That's awesome. Yeah, we've done some LinkedIn advertising and it didn't work. And it's the platform is complex. And I think mm-hmm. that there are probably some things that we did wrong. Uh, what do you see other people doing uh, when they try and run LinkedIn ads that doesn't work, that, that seems like a good idea, but really isn't? Uh, there are several pitfalls that I think most advertisers fall into when they're just trying it out for the first time. Um, those pitfalls are, are namely the things LinkedIn tells you to do, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Right, right. Um, you think that would be the right thing. <laughs> you would. Uh, so just hitting on a few of them, when you go to create your first campaign, 
Um, right below your audience targeting, there's this little box that LinkedIn auto checks called enable audience expansion. The very first thing I want you all to do is go to any campaign you're running and uncheck that box. Um, you know, we pay a premium to advertise on LinkedIn. And what that box does is it allows them to insert people into our targeting that aren't part of our ideal defined targeting. So uncheck that, make sure all of your traffic is, is coming from the exact targeting you specify. Um, the other thing that LinkedIn does is uh, when you get down into the billing, the bidding and budgeting section, the, the default option they have set there is called maximum delivery bidding. And it's exactly like it sounds. It allows LinkedIn to bid as much for those impressions as possible to spend your budget, uh, which is the most expensive way to pay for your LinkedIn traffic 90% of the time. So one of the biggest uh, recommendations I have for people is um, go down. They actually hide the option. So pass uh, the maximum delivery bidding, click on the show more options, and then there's a manual CPC bid. This is where you can say, I'm only willing to pay up to this much when someone clicks and actually takes action on my ad. And that's the cheapest way to pay for traffic 90% of the time. But another pitfall that advertisers fall into here is LinkedIn will give you a, a suggested range and they'll say, most advertisers like you are paying uh, $25 to $90 per click. And advertisers might be like, well, I don't want to be scraping the bottom of the barrel for my traffic. And so they'll bid in that in that range and they don't uh, need to. Yeah. You're 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 essentially like handing LinkedIn your wallet at that point and saying, take whatever out of it you want. Um, instead, I suggest starting much lower than what they recommend. Start it around like the, the six, seven, eight dollar range because the worst thing that can happen here is that LinkedIn goes, oh, that bid's not aggressive enough for us to show your ads and you just don't get impressions. So you come in the next day after not getting impressions that day and incrementally increase that bid up until the point where you do start getting impressions and start spending what you want. Ah, that is really, really good. So the default settings are not our friend in this exactly. case. Exactly. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> there is another default setting. I think they've taken it off now at this point, uh, but there's something called the LinkedIn audience network, which basically allows you to reach these LinkedIn members when they're off platform, when they're on Microsoft sites and uh, kind of around the web. Um, but we've done extensive testing on this and have found the traffic to just be really low quality, unfortunately. Uh, so I always tell people, uncheck that one too. Yeah, that's really, really good to know. So how does LinkedIn targeting work like compared to you know some of the other platforms? It seems like Facebook is more sophisticated, but LinkedIn has the audience that we really want. So how do we balance that out? Yeah, I think the targeting on LinkedIn, as you'd expect, is all based around who someone is professionally. Whereas on Facebook and Instagram, it's mostly like what they're interested in. Um, we have a client who's in real estate trying to reach uh, real estate agents. Um, on Meta, if I go to it and say, you know, target people who have an interest in real estate, Sure, agents are going to be in there, but so are mortgage brokers, so are uh, people who might be house hunting. And so you, you really don't get control over who that person is professionally. But on LinkedIn, we get to target by someone's job title, their level of seniority in an organization, skills, even the groups by name that they're members of. Um, we can target by company name, which is awesome for those account-based advertising um, initiatives you might be running. And we can also, like you can on all the other platforms, we can upload a list of, of individuals by email address um, to be able to target there. So lots of cool, and, and everything I've mentioned has only been like maybe a fifth of all the targeting options. It's incredible for business. Uh, we just, boy, we pay a, a pretty penny for access to that awesome targeting. Yeah. So do you think advertising works as well now as it, it did before? Do you think it's 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 better or, or worse or how is, have you seen the trends? I mean, ten years is a long time. Yeah, so it's a lifetime. In yeah, the online is, ad space. This is a really important conversation to have because you know five years ago you could come out with a really solid guide or ebook or white paper of some kind and pitch it to cold audiences, and those cold audiences would fill out information, and then your sales team would follow up with those individuals and see if they could set up a meeting to talk more about the product and, and basically turn this MQL into an SQL. What we've noticed in just the last couple years, user behavior has changed significantly. Uh, when we go to cold audiences with something that requires a form fill, they either 
will fill it out because they want the content, but then they totally ghost you after that. Um, or if they do set some sort of an appointment, half the time they don't show up. Um, you know, they ghost you in, in sales. Your sales team does not like being stood up on those calls. So we have shifted our strategy uh, so much towards the top of the funnel of dwelling on brand awareness, making sure that by the time we ask for for them to fill out anything, um, we've earned their trust. They We know they know us, like us, and trust us. We've provided a ton of value. So how can we do that today? Uh, it, it seems like organic is more and more difficult to reach our target audience. It, it seems to be suppressed in favor of ads. How do we reach that target audience to, to increase brand awareness and, and just get on their radar? We found that organic LinkedIn, especially like from you and I sharing things from our personal profiles, it's really easy to go viral. Um, ah. And how that virality works on LinkedIn is, um, so Jeff, let's say you post something if, and let's say you have uh, a thousand followers. I know you have more than that, but just throwing it out there. Um, sure, sure. If I go and comment it, and let's say I have a thousand followers as well, um, you might see that your post got 1500 views and you look at it and go, why, you know, I only have a thousand people follow me. Where did these 1500 people come from? And what it was, LinkedIn looked at your post. They saw I commented and then they put your post in my newsfeed to my connections and not all of them, but a portion of them. So what we find is really easy to go viral on LinkedIn and get a ton of people viewing. But the challenge is we don't get control over who those people are. Uh, they could be past and you know, past coworkers of mine or family members, even you just, you just don't know that they're in the right industry. And, and so not all of those views are created equal. Uh, but on the ad side, we do get to choose that. We get to define exactly who that, you know, ideal target audience is. Um, so, you know, while all the other platforms are starting to prune off or has, it's not starting, they've been doing this for a long time. They prune off your organic traffic. LinkedIn is still pretty, uh, straightforward and easy to get that traffic. Um, but it's going to result in in like the leads that aren't the highest quality, which is why you may want to use ads to make sure that you are getting the quality people. Got it. Got it. Well, there's different types of ads on LinkedIn. What have you seen that has, has worked? I mean, kind of the, the traditional as we think of in the feed, it shows there's an ad there, but that's not the only type of ads there are on LinkedIn. Yeah, my absolute favorite. So um, so you mentioned the feed ads. That's where I would suggest starting mm -hmm. for every new advertiser. Okay. Um, I, I would say probably 90 to 95% of your budget is probably going to go to the news feed in some way. There's a whole bunch of variations of news feed posts, but my absolute favorite right now is video ads. Uh, you know, okay. if you would have asked me two years ago, I would have said, oh, avoid video ads. You know, for our clients, it is so difficult to go to them and say, Hey, go create video content and get back to us. They never do videos expensive to produce. But what we found recently is it's so easy, uh, to put a basic script together, have the CEO or the founder like record on their phone. Um, you know, them mm -hmm. talking about it, yeah. showing their passion for the organization that works extremely well as very low budget, um, you know, you don't have to get a production team involved and then you have great content for right there at the top of the funnel. So that's my very favorite. And then what we like to do is retarget anyone who watches at least 50% of that video ad. So now we've, we've created a segment of like our top of funnel are those who, you know, are being exposed to that video. And then once they've watched 50%, they graduate to the next stage where we know we've had at least one meaningful interaction with them. So that's how you're moving people from top of funnel down to, to middle and, and you're continuing to segment that audience and, and move them along on that journey. Exactly. Yep. I think that's the golden ticket here. Uh, yeah. The other ad formats that... And you're saying the yeah. other one. Yeah. The, the next one is single image sponsored content. So it still shows up in the same inventory, but it's really easy to build. There's like 160 characters of text at the top, a big, beautiful image, and then like 60 characters of text down at the bottom. Um, you know, you spend five minutes in Canva and in, in Microsoft Word, like typing, and you've got something that you can put together for an ad, uh, which makes it really easy for advertisers to test. Outside of the newsfeed, there's one called text ads. It only shows up on desktop, but it, like if you open up LinkedIn on your desktop, look over in the right rail, you'll probably see three little like a uh, hundred pixel by hundred pixel 
um, logos on top of each other. Those are text ads, and they are by far the cheapest ad format on LinkedIn. You know, in the newsfeed, we'll probably pay ten to sixteen dollars a click, but for text ads, you can pay all the way down to two dollars a click, and they hardly ever get clicked on. So, you know, you have this brand awareness showing your logo basically every time they load a page uh, for very, very little money. And then we found that when we are running those ads, um, we see a, about a 13% lift on our sponsored content, our newsfeed ads. So they work really well in tandem. Is that because they recognize that the logo or just that those impressions and then they see the ad and they go, oh, there's that thing again? Yeah, it's kind of like a, oh, I, I've heard of these guys before. They must be legit, like an implicit endorsement yeah. of like, okay, this is worth paying attention to. I like that. So what do you think about, uh, you said video, uh, images, and you know, what types of images? Should they be something that's very corporate-y, sales-y? Should they be funny? Because it's different on LinkedIn than it is on other platforms. I mean, Instagram kind of has a feel. Facebook has a feel. Where, where does LinkedIn land? Yeah, the LinkedIn, you would think that the content is all very buttoned up and you know everyone in suits and that's the right way to do it. Um, but that's not the way it is because... Uh, Everyone in B2B that you might be trying to sell to, you think of them as, as a business professional, but they are a human. Humans love things that are like comedic, funny. They love things that are unexpected, uh, sometimes edgy. And so what I counsel our clients to do is don't play it safe. Um, what you want is to stand out in the newsfeed of everyone else's stuff. So if everyone else is using stock photos, you use a panel from a comic that you created or something that really stands out. LinkedIn is very like blues, grays, and whites in its color palette. If you look at a color wheel, opposite of blue is orange. So what we like to do is really saturate our imagery or, or even video heavily in oranges, greens, reds, pinks, purples, um, to help it stand out against LinkedIn, because that's the job of the image is to, is to be a thumb stopper, to get people to stop scrolling and read the ad copy you wrote, uh, where you're actually giving value and telling them what they're going to get. Uh, any favorite campaigns that you've run? Anything super memorable or effective or both? Um, it's kind of off the beaten path a little bit, but my absolute favorite campaign I ever run, ran was for a company, um, they were a helicopter taxi service, basically, uh, in, in Southern California. What they did is they were based in LA and every morning they would fill a helicopter full of people, uh, in LA going to orange County and vice versa. Um, because that's like, okay, so many people commute from there, but there's so much traffic that it's like a, a one and a half hours in traffic each way. And so they came to me and they said, Hey, we want to reach, you know, very senior executives in LA and pitch them on a helicopter ride each way that costs 200 bucks. And I told them exactly like I'd tell anyone else, you know, cold traffic, you never want to ask them directly to open up their wallet or, or do anything. They don't know, like, and trust you yet. Like it's, it's going to be a bloodbath. You're not going to want to. And they kind of twisted my arm and said, well, we just want to try. Oh man, I, I ate my words. <laughs> People would sign up for helicopter rides at 200 bucks a pop like crazy, you know, cold audiences. And it was extremely successful. But I point that out to say, I still wouldn't recommend doing that for your brand. Like these, before we ask someone to do anything, um, the average B2B buyer is like 17 touches, like meaningful interactions with a brand before they, uh, they end up buying. Um, but I will say every once in a while, there is some latent built up demand in the marketplace for your disruptive product. And you know, if you, you put out an ad, you could have cold traffic uh, converting immediately. That's really, really interesting. So if we're not asking people to buy with the ads or, or doing a direct pitch, what should we be advertising? What is working today? I think what you need to do at the beginning of, of a relationship with a brand is communicate as much emotion as possible. Make an emotional connection with them. That's why I love video ads so much is because when the founder, the CEO, or, or someone higher up at the company is sharing like the story of the, the company or uh, why they have so much passion for solving the problems they do, you can make that emotional connection. We as humans, we love to know why, why an organization is solving the problems they do, and, and we love to get invested in that. 
I, I use the example of Harley Davidson motorcycles. You know, if I were the marketer for Harley Davidson, I'm, I'm not a motorcycle guy, but if I were the marketer for them, I'd be like, oh, okay, this bike is you know, 1200 cc's and this many horsepower and does zero to 60 in, in this amount of time. But Harley didn't do that. They built a whole community around, around them. Like the people, when you buy a Harley, you are buying into a community of, of people who make you feel like you're one of them. Uh, you know, you're part of the gang and, you know, advertising and saying, you know, X horsepower or whatever, uh, wasn't going to make the community as strong as it is now where people go and get Harley Davidson tattoos on their body. I can't imagine anyone getting a B2 link <laughs> tattoo. Uh, but that's, that's the way I want you to think about it. That first touch, I want you to make an emotional connection oftentimes through video and then rely on the retargeting within the platform uh, to let you know when someone has graduated to the next level and now they're ready for the next interaction. The next interaction after they know you, we think about how do you make them like you? Well, they like you when you help them do their job better. So maybe this is where you're giving free guides, free eBooks, free checklists of ways that they can improve at their job and, and solve problems. And then, you know, I still wouldn't even gate anything up to that point if, if I have my way. Um, once they've had interactions with that kind of helpful content, finally, I'm going to graduate them to a third stage where I feel like, you know, at this point, they should know us, like us, and trust us. Now, I'm, I, I sh may have been able to earn the ability to ask them to take a meeting with sales. And that's going to be the way that I can create a machine that translates cold traffic into warm leads that the sales team is going to thank me for. I think that's really good. I think a lot of marketers get that wrong because it, it has changed. You know, five years ago, that, that probably worked. Ten years ago, it did. But uh, it's it's a little bit different today and I think continues to evolve with the information out there. So non-gated content, I think that's really interesting. Have you seen that work really well in building the relationship that know, like, and trust? Yeah, and it's so hard because ungated content is, you know, when you gate something, you get a, a, a concrete something that you can show your sales team or show your boss that's like, we paid X and we got this many leads. But if you go and try to pass those to sales after they've just downloaded a piece of content, they are unresponsive. If they are responsive, they ghost you. Like, and we've tracked this. We know it's about 1% of MQLs are translating to SQLs by going after cold audiences immediately with a form. Um, it certainly gets better when, let's say you're gating things after the, the, the first stage of a meaningful interaction. So maybe the second stage, you, you're gating a piece of content, you might see your MQL, uh, your leads MQL, or sorry, SQL at maybe 7%, but it's still really hard to show an ROI that way. If you can pass them through three stages where now they've had several strong interactions with your company, now you're seeing your MQLs graduate to SQL at like a 50 to 80% rate. And that's how you can get a, a real ROI. So when we start thinking about gating content, maybe it's it's in that middle st stage. I look at it, if I have a really great converting piece of content, it might convert at 30%. So that means I'm paying for 100% of, of this audience to get to the page and only 30% gives their information and gets it. And then 70% leave without a meaningful interaction with my company. I want to make sure that I'm maximizing those meaningful interactions. And so I'm a fan of don't gate that content. Uh, you know, let everyone get value out of it, especially if it is valuable content. Yeah. So what role does content and the, the actual content itself, whether that be images in the ads or the, the content that you're delivering, yeah, how does that play into driving successful LinkedIn ad campaigns? Yeah, I, I think your imagery, your, your visual creatives, um, they don't play as large of a role as what you'd expect. Uh, I, I think at least with my experience with clients, a lot of them tend to, uh, overestimate the importance of visual creatives. And so they'll, they'll go and spend lots of time with, with designers and super nitpick. We find that your image, as long as it gets attention, that's all it needs to do. And it doesn't super influence your click through rates or your conversion rates. So what I like to do is say, make sure your imagery uh, grabs people. It, sh it stands out. It, it pops. There's contrast. Um, and, and it is related. But 
let that be the key to getting them to read your ad copy. Your ad copy is where you're going to show them value and give them a strong call to action. If you do those, and and with imagery, I like to follow the billboard rule, which is uh, have seven or fewer words in your image. That way, at fast scroll, people intrinsically understand what it is you're trying to say. If there's more than eight words, they're going to keep scrolling and they won't get the point of what you were asking them to do. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of surprising that images don't play a a bigger role. But then again, it it makes sense because the reason people are on LinkedIn is different than, you know, maybe Instagram or Facebook or or YouTube, kind of different uses. What other surprising insights have you come across or learned on LinkedIn the last 10 years? Oh, man, I'm I'm sure there are so many. Um, I've (laughs) been I've been surprised um, on several occasions. I, I was. Uh, for one client, I was really surprised because they had a bunch of ebooks, and this has been you know eight years ago. But uh, they had a bunch of ebooks that they were having us pitch in their ads, and I was using the same process I always do. You know, try to have a meaningful image with with few words, and and my content is is telling them here's what you can expect out of this. I I couldn't get a lead for less than one hundred and twenty seven dollars, and I thought for sure like three months in with this client, I'm totally going to get fired, and. Overnight, they came out with a new piece of content. It was a guide. Um, They're in the HR space, and it was called the Definitive Guide to Onboarding. And overnight, my click-through rates doubled, uh, my conversion rates, uh, you know, tripled, and all of a sudden, I was getting leads for you know nineteen to twenty-seven dollars. And so, what I understood was the value. It, It doesn't actually matter the format that you put behind a piece of content, whether you're giving someone an infographic or an ebook or a guide or a blog post, they don't care what the format is. They care that it solves a problem for them. So when they came out with this piece of content all about onboarding, that was a problem that HR people were facing and they were hungry for it. And immediately overnight, like we saw results totally flip on their head. Um, So I I think that's my, my biggest surprise is like, don't worry about like, is the content that I have, is it an ebook or is it long enough or short enough or whatever? Make sure that it actually hits on a pain point, like the bleeding neck that your, your audience has, and they will go out of their way to consume it as long as it is valuable. I think that's brilliant. And I think I downloaded that one as well because onboarding is something that it's a challenge for everybody. It doesn't matter what business you're in. That is something, one, you're going to do on a regular basis. And, and it's not easy. It's not straightforward. I think that's a brilliant idea. Amen. How do companies find things like that that are really going to resonate with their audience um, that are not like stealing revenue? They're not going to cannibalize a paid solution. I think that's a big concern a lot of times. I don't know if it necessarily should be a concern, but it seems to come up quite a bit. I think the best advice that I can give is to really, as a marketer, know who your customer is. Like, Do the research, do the conversations um, into actually understanding who they are, what they care about, what they will engage with, what they don't care about, um, the the things that keep them up at night. This is actually really hard for marketers, but I would say to bridge that gap, go talk to your sales department and see if you can set up interviews with, let's say, uh, three people who uh, were leads but decided not to go with you and maybe three leads who recently closed and interview them. This is totally free to do. Um, See if you can have these conversations to get to know who your audience is. Once you know who they are, being able to find and create a piece of content that helps them is not that big of an issue. But if you don't know who they are and know what they care about, yeah, it's going to be like throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. It makes so much sense. I think it's so many companies don't have that granular and understanding of who their ideal clients are or why they buy. It is very much a guess or, or maybe just a gut feel. Yeah. And you totally can do it by gut feel. You, you can work your way into understanding who your audience is by spending lots of money. But boy, I think me and most marketers would agree. <laughs> like, like, you know, if you can do it for free and start immediately being effective, I, I would much rather do that. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, how do you measure the success of an ad campaign? I mean, beyond just clicks and impressions, are, are those still really valid metrics? Are they vanity metrics? How do we measure success and know whether we should spend more or kill the campaign? Yeah, I think most metrics, um, you know, some are vanity metrics, but I think everything plays a part and and helps you. Uh, for instance, click-through rate is one of those metrics that I really care about, especially at the beginning of a campaign. When I very first launch new ads, um, it, the click-through rate is going to tell me how attractive, how engaging my initial ask to that audience is. And so if I have a click-through rate of, let's say, half a percent, I might go, ooh, I might not know this audience very well, or, or I might not have hit on a, a real pain point or, or real value. But if I get a click-through rate of like one and a half percent, I know I've absolutely nailed it. So that's early on, like just a simple ratio of how many people took action versus how many people saw it. After I've been running for a little while, then I, I care about other metrics. Um, I, I want to understand, you know, if this campaign is six months old, um, it should be generating high quality sales qualified leads that sales is loving. So I want to go and look at that. Like, what is that conversion rate? How many times did we reach that user for them to, uh, to start caring? And, and we could actually ask them that, uh, you know, ask them to fill out a form without it being intrusive. Um, I want to understand at every stage of my retargeting funnel, uh, do I see my click-through rates increasing as they get further down and, and warmer and warmer? Um, you know, followers to a company page, yeah, sure, that's a vanity metric. But I would also say, you know, if we're showing ads regularly and people are being exposed to this awesome company that they've never interacted with before, there are going to be a percentage of them that go out of their way and go follow the company. And we want to see that. We want to see that organic growth as well. So I don't know if I've like hit on all the the different metrics, but uh, but I do. I care about click through rate. I care about costs per click, cost per conversion, conversion rates, and a bunch of the others along the way. What is a good click through rate? I mean, I've heard anything from you know one percent to ten percent, and and some crazy numbers um, on on LinkedIn. In your experience, what is a good click through rate where we say yes, this campaign is working, and we want to do more and optimize it? So most people's spend is going to be going into the newsfeed and the average click-through rate in the newsfeed is 0.44%. So a little bit less than half a percent. Um, I know if I can get a click-through rate that's over 1%, so a little more than double the average, um, that's when I can get my traffic for a lot cheaper. I mentioned that, that uh -huh. one of the pitfalls is using LinkedIn's max delivery bidding because uh, it's the most expensive mm -hmm. way to pay 90% of the time. But that 10% of the time that's when we get click-through rates that are over 1%. And you can switch to maximum delivery and get huge discounts on your traffic. So uh, I'm always watching for that. Where, you know, What campaign can I get over a 1% click-through rate on so I can switch my bid model and, and get much lower costs? Oh, outstanding. You've mentioned retargeting a couple of times. Do you do retargeting outside of LinkedIn or is everything that you're doing on LinkedIn, do you retarget them there or do you retarget them other places as well? I love this question. Okay, so we know that we're paying like 10 to $16 a click on LinkedIn, uh, which is very, very high. One of my favorite strategies, because if you just retarget on LinkedIn, you're sitting around, it's, it feels like you're sitting around twiddling your thumbs, waiting for people to come back to LinkedIn to see further ad impressions. And it's not the site that people come back to all the time. So one of my favorite methods is drive traffic from LinkedIn so that you know, like 100% of this traffic is highly qualified. They are exactly the, the people that we want to do business with. Get them to your website and then retarget that traffic through meta retargeting and Google remarketing. And what that does is it gets you interactions with those people. You get to stay top of mind. Your ads are showing up like everywhere that they are. And you're paying less than a dollar per click oftentimes for that traffic. So I'm a big fan of that. You don't have the same level of, of control that we do on LinkedIn of, of like, they watch 50% of this video ad. So graduate them to the next audience. Um, right. But you get such a discount on staying top of mind with them that I definitely think it's worth it. And these are audiences that are not large. So it's kind of hard to spend a lot of money, meaning you don't have to set a whole bunch of budget aside for it. Uh, it's fantastic. That, that is a ninja tactic for sure. What other things like that can you share, maybe more advanced tactics that uh, that we don't know but should? Ooh, uh, one that I absolutely love. 
when when we are uploading lists into the platform, let's say you're trying to advertise to uh, those who are already on your your newsletter list uh, or past leads you've already captured. If you download the template from LinkedIn, um, it'll ask for things like first name, last name, their email address, company title. I mean, you can fill out all kinds of stuff. What we've found is uh, email address is a really tricky field in B2B because their login email address is usually their personal email. But sales only want times, yeah. their business email. Yep, exactly. So uh, if we take whatever email addresses we have, which are usually someone's professional email, LinkedIn doesn't recognize those and they don't match at a high rate. So what we've found, if you leave out the email altogether and you just give it four fields, your first name, last name, job title, and company name, those four fields, LinkedIn, I mean, especially if those fields came from LinkedIn originally, like you pulled that off of their profile, that's going to match it, you know, near 100% rate. And you'll match a lot more of them and you don't even need their email address which I think is amazing. Like the ability to uh, to add specific people to a list and not even need their email address. Like you just bypassed a whole bunch of process. Mind blown. I mean, right there, that alone is absolute gold. And I was looking at it the opposite way where I think the email address is the most important part of that. But that makes complete sense. Well, and of course, we know that it is very valuable to own an email address because you can reuse that anywhere. You can upload that into you know Google and Quora and and Facebook, and uh, uh, it, it's so valuable to own that. Uh, so I don't love that in this strategy. I'm basically telling LinkedIn like, "Hey, I'm going to keep renting your land forever." Um, but <laughs> it is pretty awesome to yeah. be able to reach specific people without having to get their email address. That is great. Any others like that? Uh, let me think. I, I love the one of being able to switch your bidding model when you get particularly high click through rates. Um, that's one that a lot of advertisers kind of stumble on where, um, when you're bidding by the click, the higher the click through rate you have, the lower LinkedIn is going to charge you uh, for that click. But at some point they've got a, a floor where they, they're not going to consider, um, you know, showing your ads for under that. But when you switch to maximum delivery, um, you're essentially telling LinkedIn, like, show as many impressions as you want. I'm going to pay you for every one. Um, just, like, bid high for it. And when we have very, very high click-through rates, um, it plays into our favor. And all of a sudden, like, maybe manually bidding, we were getting traffic for, you know, $7 in North America, let's say, which would be a really good uh, price for for LinkedIn traffic. But we switched to to maximum delivery bidding with high click-through rates. And all of a sudden, our effective cost per click is like 530 and 460. We've even seen some costs per click get down into like the $1 range. I, I absolutely love that one. I, I Amazing. write on that one. Well, shifting gears a little bit, you know, aside from being a LinkedIn ads pro, you're also a triathlete. So how has your passion for endurance sports influenced your approach to business? I, I love this question. Um, I've always loved endurance sports. You know, I, I had friends in high school who were on the football team and they'll run like crazy to catch a ball. And I just, I hated that, but I, uh, but I love half marathons. I love triathlons. I love, um, swimming long distance, anything where I can set a pace and just work towards it. Uh, and I think that works really, really well for, for my job here in marketing, because when I, when I have a, a task that I, I want to accomplish, I set my eye on the task and you don't want to bounce around between other tasks. So I, I don't know if that's a great answer to that question, but I find that when I can mentally lock into a physical activity, I even work on a treadmill desk. So I'm even when I'm like normally working, yeah. I'm still doing some physical activity. It frees up my mind and helps me focus better on like a, a long-term kind of task. I love that. Yeah, I think any kind of physical activity just makes our minds minds better. So oh, yeah. That's, that's really interesting. And I decided, it was probably, you know, 15 years ago, I was running and listening to the same Rihanna song on, you know, that comes up on Shuffle that I've listened to a thousand times. And I just went, whoa, I, I feel like I'm wasting my time here listening to music. And so I switched over to listening to audiobooks, and now it's almost all podcasts. Oh, yeah. And I find during my workout time, is also my time to learn. And so I, I do a lot of learning through through podcasts. 
And another question I have to ask is about your company car being a wicked fast go-kart. I mean, that sounds incredibly fun. How did that come about? And how does that reflect your overall spirit of your agency? It's funny. When I was a little kid, I, I love cars. I've always loved cars, anything that goes fast. And as a little kid, like you don't get your license till you turn 16. And so I, I knew uh, there was no chance of me being able to drive anything that wasn't a go-kart. So I fell in love with go-karts. Um, I, I grew up in Arizona and the, the summers were so crazy hot. I mean, it was like 120 degrees regularly. And I remember my parents uh, went and got a phone book route, a delivery route. And so during the summer, me and my brother would strap on rollerblades. They'd fill up the back of our Subaru uh, or, or Honda with a bunch of phone books that you know used to exist. Um, and we would go and deliver them on routes and, and make money. And so there was a, a whole summer long where it went, okay, as soon as we you know, get all of our, our money from doing all these routes, I'm going to go to that Honda dealership and I'm going to buy this brand new go-kart. It's um, you know twin... 10 horsepower engines, one over each of the rear wheels. This thing was a monster. And I was like, I can't wait to go fast. And I, I went to the dealership um, you know, with all the money in hand. I was ready. And the, I, I remember the sales guy was like, oh, I'm so sorry. They just discontinued that go-kart for safety reasons like two weeks ago. And of course, my little heart was broken. Now I'm very grateful because if it was an unsafe go-kart, like I didn't want to <laughs> kill myself early on. Uh, but anyway, from a very young age, I love things that go fast. Um, fast forward to about, you know, 10 years ago, uh, I'm, a, I'm an adult. I own a car. Like, like th there's nothing I can't do. Um, but I saw a racing go-kart show up in the classified ads and I was like, my inner child is just screaming. I want that. And so I did. I, I went and awesome. got it. And since then, I've bought several go-karts and I've got a side-by-side -side that I love to tear it up in the desert. Um, <laughs> I, I think all of that goes to say, like, we are people in business and, you know, someone may love going fast and, and, and B2B marketing, and they're going to be more endeared to me than if I'm a one dimensional, oh, like, yeah. this is all I do is talk about LinkedIn ads. Uh, so I think we're allowed to bring our personalities and our favorite things into what we do. I hope so. I hope so. Well, I think that plays right back into what you said before is, you know, on LinkedIn, everybody thinks that everybody's all professional and buttoned up. But at the same time, we're people, we're humans, we have interests in other things. And I think that's one of the things that really humanizes, you know, who you are, you know, being a triathlete, you know, liking good to go fast. I mean, those are things that are, are really cool about you. And that's something that uh, a connection point for other people. Totally. And I would encourage everyone to do that. Let personality uh, creep into every aspect of what you do. Um, there was a, a guy who used to work for Microsoft and then LinkedIn um, named Jason Miller. And he absolutely loved like really obscure rock music. And he ran the LinkedIn podcast for a while. And uh, although I wasn't into the music that he was, it was pervasive throughout the whole theme of the podcast. And just, it gave it more personality, made him more endearing, made him more human, like you said. So um, I, I think it's a fantastic thing, even if what you do isn't exactly what your prospects like to do. They just, they want to see that you're multiple sided. Yeah. See that you're human. You're a real person. Mm -hmm. totally. yeah, there's enough bots in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Especially now wow. that chat GPT makes that really easy to respond. Right. As, right. As a human. right. <laughs> well, tell me about your podcast, the LinkedIn ad show. Yeah. Uh, it started right at the beginning of COVID. Um, many of you may know the, the show, uh, social media marketing podcast by Michael Stelzner. I was a guest on that show. I was talking to Michael before the show and, and he's like, when are you going to start your podcast? And, and I told you, I love podcasts. Like this is how I get all of my information. And I told him, I was like, all I have to speak about is LinkedIn ads. And, and I feel like that's way too narrow of a topic for a podcast. And he stopped me and he's like, that's exactly why you need to create a podcast about it is because it's yeah. so niche. So this is now, you know, we're 113 episodes in as of right now. And and I've absolutely loved the journey. It takes so much to put it together. Uh, and you know, so some weeks I miss an episode, but it's a, it's a weekly podcast um, where it's usually a solo show of me explaining some aspect or, or uh, how to do something in LinkedIn ads. But then we also have episodes where we bring on LinkedIn product team members to talk about the new products that they just released or things that are upcoming. And I, I think it's really, really cool Very for cool. anyone in B2B um, to to stay up to date. And, uh, you know, if they stick with the podcast, they're inevitably going to become like this LinkedIn ads hero. That's what I'm trying to create. That's awesome. 
Yeah, anybody that uh, runs LinkedIn ads, has ever thought about running LinkedIn ads, or has ever heard of LinkedIn, should be a subscriber of the show, LinkedIn Ad Show. Thanks we'll make sure to link that in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Man, it's, it is a great podcast, and there is so much to learn. Uh, it is a narrow subject, but there's a lot. It's very deep. And I think that's one of the things that, that really makes it because it is so niche, you have the ability to go deep and really dive into topics and, and learn all sorts of things as a listener that uh, I never would have known otherwise, because I don't know of another source that has the kind of information that you give on your show. Exactly. And the way I think about it, when I'm recording the podcast, I'm picturing one of my employees there. So this is my employee training and this is free to everyone. You, you get to basically sit in nice. on the way that I train my employees to be LinkedIn ads experts. So I, I hope you guys all get the value out of it that, that I intend. Very cool. Well, where can people learn more about you and about b to linked I, I think, um, follow me on LinkedIn. I'm sharing almost daily, um, you know, some LinkedIn ads, tips or tricks or strategies. And so we share a ton of stuff there. Um, also, we created this community uh, called Fanatics. It's fanatics.b2linked.com. And in that community, we have a whole bunch of LinkedIn uh, pro marketers who are all bouncing ideas off of each other and trying to understand the platform and all running tests. Nice. It's really cool. Um, also, as part of that membership, it's a really low monthly fee. It's like 79 bucks a month right now. Um, you also get access to all four of our courses that go all the way from like LinkedIn beginner to absolute, like absolute expert. So I, I would say if that's, if you want to be an absolute LinkedIn ads pro, go check out the LinkedIn fanatics community. Very good. We'll make sure to put a link to that in the show notes as well. Beautiful. AJ, I really enjoyed our conversation today. Thanks for being on SaaS Fuel. Oh, anytime. You're welcome to have me back for a round two any day. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks. Thanks again, AJ, for coming on the show and sharing your insights and resources. You know, getting LinkedIn ads to work well is a bit of a mystery. Super appreciate AJ for freely sharing how to do it right. And his big tip, don't use the default settings, which you know, you'd think would be helpful, but uh, he says they're not at all. Yeah, so super, super helpful having that advice and, and such great insight into the way the platform works and how to use that even off platform. As always, all links, highlights, resources, and full show notes are available at sasfuel.com. And don't forget to check us out on YouTube as well. Full episode, shorts, training, outtakes, cameras blowing over, uh, me inhaling a gnat, fish jumping in the background, I mean, all kinds of craziness filming outside. So share the podcast with a friend this week. I greatly appreciate it. And your friend will think that you're a genius. And we love to reward those who share. So everyone who shares it this week gets a warmth on demand smart scarf. It syncs with your phone to adjust temperature based on the weather. Forget about old fashioned wool. Welcome to the future of staying cozy. Share the podcast. Join us next Tuesday, where our founder is Jonathan Fields, CEO and co-founder of Assembly, an intranet focused on communication, employee engagement, and of course, powered by AI. We'll talk about some non-traditional ways to scale a SaaS and how they've done it over there at Assembly. And then next week on our SaaS Fuel Expert Series, we have Phil Johnson, founder and CEO of the Master of Business Leadership Program. We'll be talking about the most sought after quality in building high performing teams. And in fact, it is the number one thing that Apple looks for in their hiring process. You have to check out that episode. It is pretty fascinating. So I'll see you next time. And as always, enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to SAS Fuel. Full show notes for each episode, which includes a summary, key takeaways, quotes, and any resources mentioned, are available at sasfuel.com. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying the content and getting value from these episodes, please leave us a rating and review at ratethispodcast.com slash sassfuel. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes.